let's pray father we are so grateful to you for this moment once again it is such a privilege for us to gather together to study your word and to know you and experience you more closer lord the time we spend together in learning and in discussing your word i pray your spirit leading may be guided given to us and open our hearts and minds that we may be able to receive and perceive what you are what you want to communicate to us through your servant also lord we may be able to accept it and uh, walk in step with your spirit o oh lord the time we spent the hour may be a time of blessing for us and uh, for uh, a time of spiritual awakening in our lives we submit this time and all of us to the throne of grace asking for your mercies and uh, very eagerly waiting to hear your voice to reveal yourself to us especially in us in jesus name we pray amen amen we are moving to section 12 today in our booklet and it is titled god's grace uh yeah this is uh you know uh, a beautiful subject to discuss and talk about uh the grace of god is such a refreshing uh, you know subject for us and so there is so much we can talk about it but let's see if we can do three or four questions today so we'll straight away go to the notes we'll begin reading uh and then we'll pause to discuss a few matters okay god's grace and the first question is what is god's grace the obvious question all that the triune god does toward his creation is good and right and it is all done freely that is grace god's grace which is free and unmerited arises out of god's eternal nature and character god's grace is expressed in everything god does the deepest and most costly expression of grace is the father's redemption of sinful and rebellious humanity and the entire cosmos from the power of sin and its ultimate consequence death this redemption was accomplished through the incarnation and atoning death of jesus christ by grace the holy spirit now frees and empowers humans to repent of unbelief and to know have faith in love and worship the father and jesus christ and thereby experience the joy of eternal salvation in the kingdom of god okay so um uh it talks about god's grace uh is what he does right everything god does is is gracious uh it comes out of his very nature uh as being a god of love right and i think and i believe that uh the way the bible discusses and talks about and refers to god's grace once again is very unique now uh, it men it it talks about uh god's eternal uh, rather arises grace arises out of god's eternal nature and character just wanted to um uh, sort of uh, bring out some some aspects of that some thoughts from that and i am taking this from uh, uh an author called bill acton uh he is from the blue letter bible of you know organization uh and i thought he had some very interesting thoughts which i will share with you um so when it talks about god's grace arising out of god's eternal nature and character first and foremost we understand that god acts freely not out of compulsion his grace is what he is uh it is not forced out of him 
it is not that god has to sort of pinch himself and say oh let me just be gracious uh no it is it is something that is very natural so it act, he is he is i mean it it's an act which is freely uh provided and given and why because it is according to his nature which we know and understand is love if there's anything that explains god any any word that can encapsulate god's nature uh john in his epistle says god is love so it is out of his love um in other words its origin its cause is in the giver not the receiver right uh we can receive grace but the origin of grace is in the giver and that is god himself next point it is a gift when it, when we say it is a gift it cannot be paid for right uh or it is not withheld because of any demerit right so i thought these are the interesting ways to look at god's grace so you cannot pay for it and it is not withheld from you know from us because of any demerit in us a very important point a receiver cannot be or cannot become worthy to receive it worthiness is not part of you know i mean uh, uh, worthiness is not what uh, merits for us to receive god's grace and interestingly enough fallen human beings from our de- biblical definition hates grace <laughs> by nature fallen human beings are always a performance oriented right and that is what we are uh, we see today right performance orientation uh, you got to earn everything uh, right so so we hate grace in one sense and we resist it because we want to be uh, you know feel worthy to receive it but we can never be worthy it is never withdrawn from us i think uh, i mentioned that a little earlier but maybe it needs a uh, repeating it is never withdrawn from us on other words you and i cannot do anything to make god withdraw it uh it is a it is a natural you know outgoing love of god we cannot do anything to stop it but we can only reject it we can reject god's grace but we can't stop god being gracious to us even when we reject it god is still gracious to us so these these are some thoughts i thought you know was interesting uh and uh, one scripture that uh sort of uh, helps us understand grace from a biblical perspective romans 11 verse 6 says now if by grace that is talking about we are chosen by grace then it is not by works otherwise grace ceases to be grace right so i thought that in, that that uh, sentence is very important otherwise grace ceases to be grace so god's grace ceases to be grace if it is you know if we if we try to earn it or uh, you know we think that we can make ourselves worthy or become worthy to receive it uh, uh or we can do something to force god to give it or we can do something to stop god from giving it right so god's grace uh, we understand is not by works it is part of his nature it comes out of his nature okay so those are some thoughts i uh, thought i'll just leave you with uh, let me just see if there is one more thing here yeah another very interesting thing is he said the deepest and most costly expression of grace is the father's redemption of sinful and rebellious humanity right um I, I was just a little intrigued by this word costly you know it says uh the deepest and most costly expression of grace is of course the incarnation and death of jesus christ why 
why does it uh, why do we have to say it is costly uh, i mean god gives his grace and of course it is expressed in the death of jesus christ but why do we talk about it as being very costly um the symbol of his grace is christ is jesus christ and of course his incarnation and uh, his death what is god what is god doing there when he uh indulges in this powerful act of incarnation and death the way i look at it, it is, and maybe you have some thoughts i'd love to hear from you from regarding that the way i look at it in terms of costly is that first and foremost god is sharing himself with us right god is giving himself to us and the question we have to ask is what can, what value can you put on divine love right? what value can you put on the incarnation uh in other words when we say god shares himself with us it is the most valuable thing it is the most valuable the extreme valuable thing in terms of you know uh, his love or himself being shared with us and as uh, dietrich bonhoeffer said you cannot have grace without the cross you cannot have grace without the cross in other words this proves that god is willing to go to a length which is unimaginable he is willing to go to a length where he can come down in the incarnation take on a human nature and even go to the cross and die as a common criminal that's the extent he can go and so how valuable is that and i feel when we talk about costly grace i think this is what comes to my mind uh, but like i said you might have some thoughts you'd like to share okay so um, that is what i'd like to share from point 1 let's go to point 2 uh, question 2 uh, from me uh question 2 reads um uh, why do all people need god's grace the answer reads because all humans are sinners and cannot set themselves free from the power of sin or sin's ultimate consequences which are alienation from god and death all people need the good news that god loves us unconditionally has forgiven our sins and has reconciled us to himself through jesus christ that good news which is the gospel includes the invitation to receive by faith in christ all the benefits of living under god's grace by the holy spirit while we should not cease to pray to god for mercy we can in faith be confident that god has forgiven us and that he is at work freeing us from all our sins by grace we can confess our sins repent of them and grow in love and knowledge day by day by confession and repentance we receive as often as needed the grace of god freely given to us once again there are a whole bunch of scriptures there uh, and uh, uh, you know i'm not i'm not necessarily going to read uh, any of them at this moment so i'll leave that for you to look at so what can we glean from this uh, second question why do all people need god's grace it says because well once again the biblical perspective is we are sinners uh, we are under a fallen condition and cannot set themselves free from the power of sin or sin's ultimate consequences that perhaps is something we need to recognize in other words humans cannot undo the damage we have no power to undo the damage of the fall uh we have no power to free ourselves uh and why do we say that because all human be- human beings are under the penalty of death nobody can escape death and so uh to that extent 
uh, we have powerless in undoing the damage. So why do we need God's grace? Because we know only he has the power to do it. And because of his grace, he has already done it. And of course, we know he has done it in Jesus Christ. Uh, notice another in, uh, interesting point, which says, the, what is the consequence of sin? Alienation from God and death. Uh, this word alienation from God is also interesting. Alienation shows that we cannot bring ourselves back to God. See, most religions talk about how to come back to God, but... We have no power to do that. We, are, we don't have a mechanism to do that. We don't have your formula to do that. Uh, and that is why, from a biblical perspective, God has to reach down to us. We cannot reach God. The famous uh, uh, Tower of Babel. <laughs> People trying to reach God. Uh, and... They can go as high as they can. And today we know that, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we have looked into the very galaxies and, you know, into the universe as much as we, we can through the telescopes. And you can't reach God, you know. Uh, so that alienation is something we cannot break. It has to be from God. So why do we, why do we all need God's grace? He reaches out to us. And that is the gospel. Uh, religion says, well, do this, 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 you know, keep these commandments or uh, uh, jump over this hoop, uh, you know, to reach God. Well, not possible. I mean, you can do all your sacrifices and uh, you can't reach God. God has to reach us. That is uh, why we recognize God's grace. Now, one more thought on this. It says, by confession and repentance, we receive as often as needed the grace of God. Now, that can be just a little misleading. Uh, we might think that God's grace can be received by our confession and repentance. But God's grace was given to us before our confession and our repentance. God's grace was made available while we were still sinners. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. So what, what's the meaning of this by confession and repentance we receive? Um, what, I, what I understand from that is that uh, confession and repentance is necessary for us to experience God's grace. God's grace is already given to us. But how do we experience it? Well, we participate in it through confession and repentance. In other words, confession and repentance is not a condition to receive God's grace. It is a way for us to experience that which is already available in Christ, you know, uh, and, and, and through the Holy Spirit. So, uh, uh, so all of this brings, you know, this answer to this question, why is it that we need God's grace? So in other words, God, God you know, is insisting that we participate in the, in the giving that he has made available to us. That is God's grace. All right, let's go to question number three. Question number three reads, what is forgiveness of sin? Once again, I think some of these things may have some kind of, some sort of repetition from our previous uh, sections, but it's, it's, it's good for us to uh, repeat some of these because it brings us into sharper focus or our understanding has sharper focus when we discuss these. So the answer for what is forgiveness of sin reads, through the incarnation and crucifixion of Jesus Christ, God has taken responsibility to overcome evil and put all things right. Because of Christ, God no longer holds our sins against us. Christ alone is our righteousness and our life. He is our only hope. Grace alone, not any merits of our own, is the basis on which God has forgiven us in Christ. 
Faith alone, not our works, is the means by which we receive Christ into our hearts and with him the forgiveness that makes us whole. Christ alone, grace alone, and faith alone bring the forgiveness from God that is attested to in the gospel. Okay. So, um, forgiveness of sin. How does this sit with God's grace? Uh, God's grace uh, results in the forgiveness of sin. As he shares his grace with us, as he gives us his grace, it results in the forgiveness of sin. Right? So, that basically means that God has taken responsibility to overcome evil and put all things right. God has, you know, taken the initiative to uh, sort of uh, address the problem of sin. Human beings did not and human beings cannot. So God has taken the responsibility to overcome evil and put things right. So what? What is the need for, or what is this thing called forgiveness of sin? Right. Uh, remember, the damage had to be done, uh, undone. And the forgiveness of sin reverses this damage. The, for, the, the act of forgiveness, which is God's grace, reverses that damage and moves us towards wholeness. Right? Moves us towards wholeness. The wholeness which we lost uh, in the fall. So uh, another way of uh, talking about God's grace is the forgiveness of sin. It is, a, it is an act that God indulges in so that he can reverse the damage and move us towards a sense of wholeness. Okay. That is basically what uh, uh, I can pick up from that. Let's look at one more question and then we will get into our discussion. Let's go to question number four. This is related to question number three on forgiveness. Does forgiveness mean that God condones sin? And the answer, the simple answer is no. God never approves of sin. Although God is merciful, God does not condone what God forgives. In the death and resurrection of Christ, God judges what God abhors, everything hostile to holy love, by abolishing it at its roots. Because God is for his creatures, he must uh, be against all that is against them. Evil thus has no future. In this judgment, the unexpected occurs. Good is forcibly, not naturally, brought out of evil circumstances, hope out of hopelessness, and life out of death. God spares sinners who welcome God's judgment and his condemnation of all sin and evil, including their own, which was accomplished in Jesus Christ. God turns them from enemies into friends. The uncompromising judgment of God to do away with all evil and its consequences is revealed in the suffering love of the cross. Okay, let's uh, just catch a few thoughts from there and then we will uh, get into our discussion. So the question uh, asks, does God, or rather, does forgiveness mean that God condones sin? And the simple answer we said is no, God never approves sin. Why? Uh, what, you know, what's the sin about that God hates so much? Uh, the interesting, uh, an interesting thought here needs to be brought out. God does not condone what God forgives. Right? Um, in other words, God has to be against sin because sin is antithetical to his very nature. Everything that sin does is destruction and alienation. And that is not God. God is, uh, you know, uh, love and light and grace. And he is none of, the, none of what, you know, sin 
stands for. Uh, he must be against all that is against his good creation. Right? Now, if God is not against sin, or like some theologies can even go to the ex extent of saying that God, uh, you know, sort of uh, creates evil. Now, there is a verse that talks about it, but then we will discuss that another time. You see, God cannot be against himself. Sin is against the goodness of God. How can God be against himself if he approves sin? Then God becomes a contradiction. Right? If God is for sin, then God becomes a contradiction. Uh, like uh, some people are a contradiction. You know, maybe Anil will know who I'm referring to. <laughs> uh, there are people who are contradictions in themselves. I mean, uh, God is not a contradiction. Uh, and so he has to, I and mean, he is opposed to sin. So God never intended sin, you could say. He never intended for sin to enter into the created order. But of course, then you say that, you know, where did it come from? You know, and of course, that's another question. Maybe we can talk about it another time. But there is one interesting thought here that though sin entered the created order, God is not surprised by it. He's not shocked by it. Uh, he was not taken off guard by it. He can still work in it to bring good. Right? Now, he doesn't need sin and evil to bring good. But since evil and sin now has entered the created order, his sovereignty, his you know, absolute sovereign uh, perspective, the sovereignty of God like we talk about, is able to still work in it to bring good out of it. Even though God never intended uh, evil to exist and sin to exist. So the uncompromising judgment of God, as it says in the answer, the uncompromising judgment of God is to do away with all evil. In other words, uh, forgiveness, the forgiveness that God offers is actually a judgment against sin. It is not a judgment against us. We are the victims. And his grace and his forgiveness that flows out of his grace is actually a judgment against sin. Right. And of course, he decided that he would do it through the suffering love of the cross, which again uh, is something that, uh, you know, is very, very uh, hard to fully comprehend. But nevertheless, like we said earlier, God spares no effort to make sure sin is finally defeated, like it says. In other words, sin and evil has no future. It has met its it has met its uh, challenge in Jesus. Jesus has defeated sin and evil ultimately. Okay, I think I'll uh, stop there. I think there's a lot that we have uh, talked about. Let me hear some thoughts from you. And uh, if you have, uh, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. The floor is open. Okay. Uh, if you're st struggling to start off, uh, maybe <laughs> then I'll pose a question to you and uh, ask you to uh, give me uh, some of your thoughts. Remember, I was talking about talking about uh, God's uh, grace or the expression of his grace being very costly. Uh, how do you look at that? How do you read that? Rekha, you have a thought. Go ahead. Yes. It's costly for God too, but it's costly for us because we have to put God first in everything we leave 
parents behind, really whatever else is in our, an idol in our lives, we have to leave it behind. So it's costly for us as well. But of course, God's is more costly than yes. us. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I suppose you're uh, also referring to the fact that uh, the amount of damage it has done for us, you know, I, I mean, it's a, sin has damaged us so tremendously that uh, uh, to that extent, it is costly for us because uh, we have to walk, you know, the straight and narrow to finally experience God's grace. Uh, like you say, you've got to leave things behind. You got you may have to go through some sacrifices just to be able to receive God's grace. Right? Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts? Uh, any perspectives? Praveen, you have a thought? Okay. Um, I'll just make few uh, bring few thoughts before you regarding the word grace. This is something very beautiful, and I love it very much. And especially the Trinitarian perspective. Uh, gives entirely a different definition for grace than what we are usually hearing. Usually we hear the word grace means unmerited favor. Uh, the merit that we receive though we are we don't deserve. We, we all know the definition very well. Still, still the definition is lying on uh, a particular um, uh, system called deserving and not deserving a judgmental kind of system uh, qualified or not qualified kind of thing uh, which is completely based on you know that will take us towards uh, yes on what basis we are judging something is qualified and not qualified and obviously it goes towards law or a certain set of rules and uh, you know a structure but God's grace is beyond that and uh, in, according to our Trinitarian perspective, God's grace is an expression of God being himself. Uh, God is love. He is being himself. He's called God is being gracious. When it comes to us, actually, when God is, God wanted to be himself, love is always giving. And we all know uh, how the giving was there in the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And he wanted to stretch it. Where he is, because he is being himself. Uh, that is where he created us. You know. So in our very creation itself, we could see the grace. We all, for some reason, we talk. We start when we talk about grace. We talk about qualified sin. These kind of stuff we bring. What about the very existence God gave us? We should start from there. It is not from where we have fallen. Even before we were fallen, we are, we, are, we are given existence. That itself is the grace of God. So the grace of God is God being himself. It is not based on qualified or sin or anything. So what is the sin in this case? Actually, God being gracious to us, even before humans uh, were fallen, he is expressing his grace to us and he did not change. From the beginning till the end, he never he is not going to change. He is immutable. And when we committed sin and have fallen, he did not change God. God being himself the same. One small example we can see is in the Garden of Eden. God had given everything to Adam freely to eat. Uh, taking that, receiving that is be receiving grace and living in that grace. And when Adam says, oh, I want to get the knowledge of good and evil independent of God, not from God, separately from, apart from him. That is not receiving, nor, nor we, are, we don't want to let God be who he is in our lives. That is rejection of grace. So the grace was there even before, in fact, to speak, even before the foundation of the world, as the scripture says, the lamb was slain, slain from the foundation of the world. And you and me are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Uh, in Christ, we are chosen before the foundation of the world. On what basis did he choose us? Very simple thing. The basis of his very nature, which is love and his very grace. So when we talk about grace, starting from uh, either sin or qualified or not qualified is not complete. I'm not saying unmerited favor definition is wrong. No, but it, but it falls short of the real grace that we find in the Bible. 
and uh, god god so god being himself is god being gracious to us and god sharing his very nature to us How, what is the very nature of god love in we we take the word uh, synonymous in synonyms grace also can be taken part of that okay what is that god he is sharing his nature with us in other it, it means he, he is expressing his grace to us and uh, he is creating us is uh, god being gracious to us and one comment i would like to make about the expression we read uh, god's grace is very costly this expression we find only in one place in the bible that is in book of corinthians it, it at the moment we hear about the cost it 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 reminds us and takes our understanding or attention towards some kind of transaction god gave something or some kind of transaction he pay and there is a verse in bible also it is written you have been purchased by the blood of christ that's also in book of corinthians first corinthians chapter 3 you are purchased by the precious blood of christ so these expressions actually from where did god purchase and then bring people bring all sorts of controversies saying god paid to satan god paid to humans or jesus paid to the father or father paid to jesus all these things are there one simple thing we need to understand when we talk about the cost it is actually apostle paul's expression of explaining the value of cross or value of god's grace uh, corinth is a commercial city and the most of the people there they have two uh, what we'll call shipyards then you can understand how busy the city will be how business would be in that place and most of the people are into business there so it is one of the expressions apostle paul uh, he chose to explain to people the value of god's grace okay it is not uh, it is not to be counted like you know uh, like who got paid this to somebody that he paid that to somebody that is not uh, the meaning of this thing he wanted to explain how great god's grace is in human language and definitely uh god's grace is something when we uh, unless we get into some kind of these analog analogies or some kind of structure we would not be able to relate to it that is the very reason apostle paul used this expression uh, of course we did not discuss about the distorted the interpretations of this word but i'm just i'm just bringing to your notice so that uh, we may be aware of uh, such interpretations we hear around uh, yeah that's what i would like to very good thank you uh uh pravin and uh, yes uh, in fact when i was uh, when you were mentioning that is very interesting when you mentioned about uh, uh god is grace personified <laughs> i think uh, jesus christ is referred to as the grace of god right so uh yeah in the very first question what is god's grace uh everything uh god does is gracious so or you rightly you know recognize that and in terms of this costly thing like i mentioned uh it's basically god sharing and how can you put a value to it the value is so great so maybe the costliness you know uh, can be looked at it i i just wanted to add one more thought there it is so valuable that when you have it you have everything but when you reject it you have lost everything right so when you accept god's grace you have everything because mm-hmm. that is the most valuable but when you uh, reject it then everything is lost and you know all value is gone good very good any any other perspectives let me just power my computer here can i use the business transaction go ahead uh i thought somebody was asking question no right yes suryamurthy go ahead uh you have to unmute yourself we can't hear you can you hear me yes go ahead the point which nags me always is 
what about those around us who have rejected Christ? Around me. Though some people might have casually heard about Christ. Some people might have really heard something about Christ. Some people, some people might not have ever heard about Christ. So the, that keeps on nagging my mind. What about their rejection? Okay. Uh, well, when you use the word rejection, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it can apply to someone who probably has never heard of Christ or uh, maybe have not understood Christ uh, in, in, you know, in, that, in the sense where they can make a proper response. Uh, rejection would be a deliberate, willful act having known who Christ is and the Holy Spirit having illuminated his mind to understand Christ, that's a deliberate rejection. And of course, that is a serious... Uh, uh, Not for a casual listener. Sorry? Not for a casual listener. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we, have, we hold the truth that God cannot reject, you know, God cannot reject anyone. Uh, who has not known him. I mean, God never rejects anyone. He is, gives his grace to everyone. It is those who reject him who have lost out, you know. So, uh, but what about those who have not known Christ and uh, probably have not understood him or never heard, you know, uh, like you said, casually have known him? <clears throat> Once again, the Bible, I don't think, makes that very clear. In the past, we used to talk about the first, second, and third resurrection. And we thought that everybody will be given a chance. Uh, in, in one sense, we still hold that, whether we can talk about first, second, third resur resurrection in the way we did in the past. But I believe that nobody would ultimately be lost because he doesn't know who Christ is. Everyone will come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And so uh, that is the very nature of God. I mean, otherwise God is once again, his, his, you know, he's contradicting his very nature. If he has created us, then he has to give us every opportunity to, to know him. Yeah. So we still hold that the first, second, third resurrections are valid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, we, we move away from right. Or belief. We cannot say Certainly, but this is our belief at this point. Yes, our belief is that God will give everyone a fair chance. We, he cannot reject anyone. Like for example, I mean, uh, I think we discussed this sometime uh, back. The, uh, the Calvinistic teaching, you know, of John Calvin is that God has deliberately made or created some to be damned. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't hold that to be true. We don't accept that. That is some of the reformed theology that uh, some churches have embraced. They believe that uh, some are created to actually, you know, be rejected and be thrown and in, cast into hellfire. Uh, we who don't hold that. Uh, those who will go to hell is because of their own deliberate choice, not because of what God has done. <clears throat> Here, in, yeah. I mean, most of the preachers here preach that those who are not saved at this time, in other words, those who have not responded to Jesus' calling, are doomed. They are, they are straight away going to hell. There is no... But that, again, goes against the very nature of God. I mean, what about the... Tribal folks living in Andaman or wherever in the forest of my Bolivia, district, who, who have never even heard of Christ. Do you mean to say that Christ will just, uh, you know, condemn them like that? Yeah, I don't think so. The Bible doesn't tell us, but I'm sure there is some kind of plan. Right. I mean, uh, I, I I go back to this, uh, you know, I, uh, this this saying that God has in the in the scriptures. God tells us to love our enemies. Now, if he's asking, requesting, I mean to say, if he expects us to love our enemies, how much more he loves 
<laughs> everyone right uh, including his enemy but i wonder why god has not revealed it in the bible as to what will happen to the others no no as <laughs> as as far as i think he has revealed it where several places i have noted down several places he says everybody will be saved yeah all nations everybody will be saved so in some in at least five or six places he says everybody will be saved uh are you so talking i am thinking in the, this way i am concerned about, concerned about my mother my father my yeah. daughter my exactly. people people in my village entire countryman okay uh, bertie go ahead can you hear me yes uh i i wonder whether surya murthy is referring to the passage where i think it's in romans where god says after the number of the gentiles come in uh then shall all israel will be saved or will be delivered uh, shall, uh yeah then shall all israel be saved for the deliverer will come forth from zion and will turn ungodliness from jacob is surya murthy referring to that or what is it no, all i am israel- not referring to that all israel not... shall be saved uh, for for it qualifies uh, that statement by saying for the yeah. deliverer referring to the lord jesus christ when he uh, comes in all power and glory when he sets his throne in mount zion in jerusalem he says uh, for the deliverer deliverer will come and turn ungodliness from jacob but before that it says after the number of the gentiles have come in or uh, the gentiles have been made acceptable to god you know they have uh, you know Bhati. Yes, prepare please. for god yeah tell me surya ha tell me i am not referring to the verse unfortunately i have not written down the verses it is on my computer in at least five or six places okay it is very clearly not referring to israel no i make a not referring, referring to israel i will make a call all it is israel mr zakari can you qualify can you explain that Uh, yeah i'll i'll come back to that i think franklin did you have a thought franklin no sir nothing sir no oh, sir nothing i thought i thought you wanted to say something prabhi you wanted nothing. to say something thank you sir uh, just as far as uh, whatever been discussed about the people who are, who never got opportunity to hear the name of god or who rejected or this this stuff number one thing is uh, let god be the judge and uh, let us not play uh god's uh, judge god's judge role by ourselves by the whatever oh, the information we knew uh from the scripture we just leave it better leave it into the hands of god number one number two thing is uh, for some reason for uh, entire uh, the modern day christianity has been taken uh, taken by this thought that is gospel is always gospel is about hell and heaven gospel is not about heaven and hell gospel is is about christ and uh, how we, how christ has redeemed us to be his children and uh, if you read book of acts i repeatedly said this in not even one place you will find any apostles preaching the gospel believe in jesus you will go to heaven if you don't believe you will go to hell this is the modern day modern day gospel which we are hearing primarily so praveen uh, yeah so praveen we are talking about all other people we are not talking about christians we are talking about other people i am talking about others only uh, so i am talking about you are talking they are outside of that suri murthy let praveen finish and then you can bring in your thoughts because you are going he is going on the other track no we uh, started the topic on those unbelievers yeah, yeah. let's going on the track of believers this is thought go ahead prabhu sorry for interrupting uh, no but problem. what i felt was that no that is no a problem. very different fact uh, no problem whatever i'm not trying to speak about the fate of people who are believing and who are not believing uh, that is not my point what am i trying to say is gospel may not be uh, what if gospel is not about a place gospel is about person jesus christ well, when we when we preach the gospel so the moment we put our faith our focus and our hope is not about uh, as christians our hope is not about heaven only our hope is about christ in fact if you read book of revelation book of revelation doesn't end with uh, we, we we going to heaven 
heaven comes down to us actually christ comes down to us always god comes down to us it is god's dwelling is with us he he says i am their god and they shall be my people that's how he speaks so perhaps we have narrowed down the gospel to so called a destiny of a place a heaven or hell that is the reason we have all these problems perhaps if you could uh, look more into the sense like you know what christ has done gospel is always about what christ has already done news is about a past event we discuss about what christ has done primarily and uh, so it, let us discuss more about that rather than uh, speculating on a place of uh, deciding about a destiny of uh, somebody that perhaps that may not be the main uh, focus that's the reason uh, apostles also did not do much about it uh, so so uh, yeah that's that, that's just a thought thought we are we are, we are not uh, you know trying to find find out why what etc we just say that this is a very uh, uh, what should i say it's very right. obvious uh, thing where it is natural for us to worry about our loved ones who probably not even heard of christ so the question is what will happen to them of course i mean uh, the gospel is christ and christ centered but that does not answer the question as to what does god have in mind for those who have not even heard the gospel who are of course those who are deliberately rejected that's i'm not talking about them but those who have not even heard of christ are, is their destiny just to be condemned no i don't think so however i don't know where uh, we can find that in the in the in the bible i okay. have one single thought okay. regarding that uh, i i'm i'm not dogmatic about this statement but uh, i really uh, liked what uh, billy graham said it is very old age uh, he said a statement saying uh, uh, there are lots of people in the world who never heard the name jesus people from hindu community muslim community buddhist community from just a tribal community who never heard the name jesus but they have a sense in their heart something is wrong with them and uh, god he has to come and he has to save me i cannot save myself who ever have that conviction he says that they may be they they may come uh, they may find themselves in the uh, great salvation of the lord uh, so uh, for me that that is a statement that can gives hope uh, so just in sharing yeah, with but, you but they are also which god do, are they are they thinking of when they say <laughs> Uh, we i can't say much so there has to come a god is it vishnu is it uh, allah is it uh, you know ashtar yeah. who that is the question you know everybody has that feeling that no we are incomplete we can't save ourselves but the question is which god are we talking about and that's where the problem comes in yeah you rightly said uh, last uh, statement i'll say and close i will not uh, step in any more uh, that is uh, the name of jesus or christ these are not basically a name to call people these are revealing about the very character very act of god mm -hmm. so jesus is called he saves his people from sin that's why he is called uh, jesus so we need to take the names more in that uh, manner rather than just uh, uh, the name jesus as something some kind of name given to identify him uh, yeah that's all i have to read but you know jesus or god or yahweh it is still the true god the real god right that is the one the that you need god. to know the creator god and not some uh, you know god in your own fancy that's where that's what you know uh, it boils down to people don't know god and that's where uh, we don't know what will happen uh, because the bible bible according as far as i know has not really specified what will happen like uh, i mean suri murthy uh, you you had a thought to share i'll just like uh, just Bertie, add... okay. just hold on bertie can you just let suri murthy talk i stand okay. by my statement there there are verses in the bible no oh. we say that all will be saved okay well, yeah. maybe yeah. next time you can bring another it another thing yeah another thing yeah when i think about this subject i always tell myself like abraham shall not the god of all the earth be a fair judge uh, are you able to i am not i am not uh, quoting exactly but you can re recollect this verse yeah so okay. shall not the god of all the earth 
be a fair judge. Having given life to everybody, right? Why, why will he again abandon them? Uh, yes, thank you, Srimurti. And uh, what you're talking about is actually universalism. Uh, yeah. It says that uh, all has to be saved. What we can do is, uh, once again, there are pros and cons. There are there are debates for it and against it. And no, I... we can bring a GCI position to it. And maybe next time we can discuss that because obviously yeah. time is uh, more or less fleeting. Right. Yes, final thoughts, Surya Murthy? About this universalism. <laughs> I, uh, I read that article by Mr. Tikach. It's a very lengthy article. He comes to the same conclusion by some method which we do not know. Every is, everybody is going to be saved. Okay, that is... Uh... Uh, that is Mr. Tikach's thought. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's a GCI position. <laughs> no, Mr. Tikach's article. Yeah, maybe we'll we'll come to that later. Bertie, you had a thought? He, he yeah. uses the same word, universalism. That yeah. is why I remembered it. Okay. Yeah. Bertie, go ahead. Yeah, it's it says, I can't quote the exact verse, but it's been, the Bible mentions that uh, Jesus' name is given uh, to mankind as the only name uh, in under heaven to be saved. Okay, right. Okay. Uh, once again, they, they can, you know, I mean, uh, we need to understand sometimes the scriptures are not as explicit as we would like it to be. Uh, and we can then go off into various kinds of speculation. Uh, I, I think like Praveen said, finally, we have to leave it to God. Uh, some things are not laid down, you know, in black and white. Uh, so, what we can do is this this thought about universalism is once again uh, you know uh, uh, widely debated so maybe we can bring that up uh, in one of our studies okay. but as uh, as always time has gone by thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us this evening and we'll continue to uh, have these forums where we can uh, debate and learn, not debate, but uh, not discuss. <laughs> so, Surya Murthy, if I can yes. request you to close in prayer, that will be helpful. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, we are very much thankful to you for giving this Bible study every midday week. We try to understand a lot of things which you have shown in the Bible. My life is my life. My life especially is attached to the Bible since last almost 50 years. I cannot live without the Bible. Now that you are teaching me these things, I'm very much thankful to you. I, I am thanking you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very Amen. much. Amen. Amen. <laughs>